you talk a lot on the website about your social mission. Um, can you talk about that? And also, you're a B Corp, is that correct? And like, can you talk, tell us what that is? And I actually didn't know what that was until now. <laughs> It's something that was really important uh, for, for us as a founding team when we, when we were talking about the, the concept and launching a business um, was not only the, um, you know, the uh, ability to disrupt this, this massive industry that really stifled innovation, uh, but also just creating an organization that did something good in the world. Um, and so we've been trying to be really thoughtful about kind of all stakeholders that we touch. And so that starts with our customers and treating our customers really well providing a $500 product for $95 and providing great service behind that. Um, but we also spend a lot of time thinking about our environmental impact and how we can minimize that. So we're 100% carbon neutral as an organization and, um, and take into account kind of all the, all the energy that goes into producing our glasses, shipping back and forth, all the energy um, mm -hmm. that, that we produce in our office and buy carbon offsets for that. Mm -hmm. um, as Neil mentioned, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can create a, a great open environment for our employees. So when we moved into our office uh, here in Soho, uh, the first thing we did was just knock down every wall. Uh, we don't have any offices, any cubicles, um, and have tried to create a really transparent environment for our employees for them to learn and thrive and have frequent 360 degree reviews and um, offer people health care from day one and um, gym reimbursement and just kind of things that um, we feel every company should, should offer their employees. Yeah. Um, and then beyond that, we spend a lot of time thinking about kind of how we can use this organization uh, to have an impact on, on the broader community. Um, and so that, that starts with our buy a pair, give a pair program where for every pair of glasses we sell, we distribute a pair to someone in need. Mm -hmm. And so we've partnered with um, uh, great nonprofits. Um, our primary nonprofit partner is Vision Spring that Neil used to run uh, before we started the company. Mm. Um, and they actually train uh, men and women all over the world to become entrepreneurs themselves and sell glasses into their local communities that otherwise wouldn't have access to glasses. So it creates a really sustainable solution. Um, and then we also we sponsor a little, a little league team um, in Greenwich Village and um, are always thinking about how we can use our company um, really as a vehicle to have a positive impact in the world. Mm. Um, and, uh, and so there seems to be kind of like a um, a wave of uh, interesting new e-commerce sites, and I guess they seem to be mostly in New York. Um, you guys, there's like Birchbox, Gilt, uh, people talk about you know Fab, I don't know what else. Um, I think there's some others. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it seems to be kind of, I don't know, like a some kind of trend or something. Do you, <laughs> do you guys, uh, I mean, what do you make of that? We think that New York's just a hub of so many industries, and e-commerce often crosses, uh, you know, all those different spaces. Uh, so for us, New York was the right place to be because we're a fashion brand, and this is the fashion capital of the world. Um, it's where it's the media capital, and, and you know, we leverage PR. We've grown this quickly, primarily through PR and word of mouth, and mm -hmm. it's uh, I think a lot of it because we have relationships here that we can meet with people. Yeah, um, it's a lot of that early. Whatever you said, mentioned Vogue or whatever, getting in. I mean, those people are all here. I guess is that exactly. And and I think it's it's really hard to get that attention or at least be an active participant. You know, if you're in Palo Alto, if you're in L.A. Um, uh, likewise, I think there's a really robust social enterprise community here um, that sort of goes back to our Vision Spring, our primary nonprofit partner. You know, is based here. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I think that this is just uh, because of all the different uh, industries that are here and uh, there's some entertainment um, and certainly from a retail perspective, right, this is, you have Madison Avenue, um, you have Soho, uh, and so we're, uh, while we're not trying to mimic what happens in bricks and mortar, we're certainly learning from it. And we're able to, within our own office, we have a showroom that we get about 100 people in a day trying on glasses and purchasing glasses actually through our website, but after they try on the glasses in person. Um, and this acts as a learning laboratory for us. And they're able to go t to this non-retail building on the fifth floor. Uh, but I think that's really special that you're in New York and there's actually pedestrian traffic and people can get to it easily. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so I, I went to Berkeley and, and lived in San Francisco afterwards. And I think I was sort of brainwashed into uh, thinking that if you wanted to launch a startup, particularly anything internet-based, you had to do it in the Bay Area. There was kind mm -hmm. of no other place. Uh, but you know, for all the reasons that, that Neil mentioned, uh, you know, uh, primarily the fact that we wanted to launch a fashion brand, it really made sense for us to be in New York. Um, and it's been 
really exciting to see how much energy there is in the startup scene here. And, um, and there's a really collaborative culture. So um, we chat all the time with uh, you know, CEOs and teams from, from other startups. And mm. there's just a ton of information sharing and kind of um, everyone is, is just kind of trying to, to help and, and create this, this yeah. hub of innovation here in New York. So that, that addresses the New York part. I guess the other question I have is like, why now? Like, so between you know 2000 and you know you had Zappos, like 2002 and 10. Like Zappos was, of course, they've been around since the 90s, but they grew. You had Diapers.com, which actually I think was another uh, pen startup, yeah. Yeah. Um, which Amazon bought for 500 and some million dollars <laughs> or whatever. Um, but you kind of didn't have that much n innovation, I think, in e-commerce, and now suddenly there's this way. I mean, do you have any idea, sense as to why that's happening now? Um, I, I think the economic downturn really helped propel a lot of e-commerce companies because at the end of the day, the internet allows one to deliver value. So companies like ours, that's providing a $500 product at $95, yeah. right? There's there's not a better time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which is so just uh, sort of the downturn. People yeah. get more price sensitive. Exactly. Counter cyclical. You, yeah. Those that provide value sort of win. And I think in this environment. does that does that though then worry you if the economy turns around? And I mean. Some people say that, like Gilt, for example, had layoffs, and people were people have speculated it's because it was sort of a downturn. Pro, you know, it was like offering discounts, and that's good in a downturn. I don't know. But I think people improved. get used to uh, to shopping um, in in different ways, and um, you know. Five, ten years ago, it might have seemed really weird to order a pair of shoes online, but now people do it all the time. And, and I think people are, are getting more comfortable with the idea of just purchasing um, goods that they're used to walking into a store yeah. and buying those online, and they're realizing how convenient it is. And so um, yeah, I think they're, um, it's kind of category after category. Um, you're seeing consumer products that people said you could never sell that online. Yeah. They, people are building massive businesses. And so when we started looking at the eyewear industry, Less than one percent of eyeglasses were sold online, but um, we're huge believers in, in the fact that eyeglasses are going to follow kind of all these other consumer yeah. product categories, and more and more of that spend is going to go online. So just sort of, it just takes time for you know consumer behavior to change, and that's just happened. And, yeah. and as it happens, okay. and I think it becomes sticky, and value is sticky. And the other thing that I think happens is that you develop relationships with internet-based companies that you might not be able to with sort of your typical bricks and mortar retailers. So um, through you know our website and all of our channels, whether we're on Pinterest or Facebook, right, we're able to tell compelling stories and tell why we do certain things, how we do it, who are the people behind the brand. And I think people relate to that and it resonates with them. Um, with the internet, I think we all know that you can't hide anymore. And a lot of these in particular, and we'll talk about the fashion industry, which we're in, it's just you have these luxury brands that have, um, through these static pages in Vogue and GQ, created this aspirational world. But now uh, people can look behind sort of those pages. And if they don't find anything, it's sort of vacuous. Mm. Um, but whereas, you know, a brand like ours, we're able to say, hey, there's thought and deliberateness between everything that we do, and this is why. Um, we recently released an annual report um, that was non-traditional, right? It didn't have so, a ton yeah, of um, economic metrics, but it talked about, you know, what were the common sort of uh, search, misspelled search terms for Warby Pepper, like Warby uh, Barker. And it just, it, it was funny stuff. Um, and what bagels we were eating in the office and what beer we were drinking during happy hour. And it actually led to our three highest consecutive days of sales, which we mm -hmm. weren't expecting at all. Um, but it took on a life of its own and became viral quickly, which is rare that when talking about yourself, it goes viral. But I think it just goes to show that we've built some goodwill by explaining why we're doing Doing it, that we you know we have altruistic intentions. Yeah, and so um, you know, for people who might be watching, who are thinking about starting a company or, or maybe starting a company, what would be your top you know top things maybe you've learned, maybe that surprised you since since you uh, were back planning things or. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the probably the two biggest pieces of advice that you know we give people that um, when they are, are talking about launching a, a business is you know number one just focus on solving real problems, um, particularly if it's something that's a problem in your own life. And so, um, as a founding team, we all had that frustrating experience, and we couldn't understand why glasses cost five hundred dollars, and that really led to the spark uh, for the idea behind Warby Parker. Um, mm -hmm. And the the other piece of advice is just always focus on providing an amazing customer experience. So uh, one metric that we track really closely and, and are really proud of is our net promoter score, which is mm -hmm. a measure of customer satisfaction. 
um, in our score, every time we've measured, it's been the high 80s or low 90s. So Net um, Promoter, just so people know, is like uh, there's a there's like a H HBS article I think about it, like the only number that matters, and it's just like the per it's the what is it like percent of people that use your website or buy something that then go and promote it to their friends or something. Is that yeah, right? so you, you ask customers on a scale from zero to ten, how likely are you to refer this product or service to a friend or family member? Yeah. And you take the the people that voted. 10 or 9, and subtract everyone that voted 6 or below, and that's your net promoter score. Okay. Um, and so, and that's, that some people, smart people argue that's like the only number that matters. Right, so right instead I mean. of <laughs> you know, asking people you know, a 30 question customer satisfaction yeah. survey, ask them this one question and you get all the information you need. Um, and so we track that really closely and our scores are higher than Zappos and Apple and any published benchmark we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, and so that remains kind of a the biggest focus for us is just making sure each and every customer has an amazing experience. Um, and we're seeing huge dividends with our customers just spreading the word um, through through word of mouth and, and all these online channels, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Tumblr, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think if you if you really just focus on your customers, um, all revenues and profits and kind of all, all the, the things that people you know focus, focus too much on, um, kind of all those things fall out. I see. Uh, we're, we're out of time, but thanks so much for being here. Thank Great. you. Thank you.